I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about simple linear regression. In particular, we're talking about uncertainty and prediction intervals. If you haven't watched it before, you might want to go back and watch a video that I have about simple linear regression, I'll put a link up here, uh, that introduces in particular an example that we use in this slide set. And so that might be worthwhile going back and checking out before you take a look at this uh, slide set. As usual, down below there's a PDF version of these slides. Alright, so just as a reminder, this is our simple linear regression model. So we have in a response y, it's independent, normally distributed, the mean is beta naught plus beta 1 xi, and the common variance of sigma squared. And now we talked in that previous video about beta naught being interpreted as what happens when the explanatory variable is zero, right? So what we mean by that is this, the expected value of the response y when x is zero is just beta naught. And we talked also about how to provide an uncertainty estimate for that situation when x is zero. The uncertainty interval that we have is this one, kind of complicated. Uh, beta naught is our, sorry, that hat beta naught is our estimate of beta naught from the data. We have this t critical value. Then we have our estimate for the standard deviation, that's sigma hat, times this square root of one over n plus x squared divided by n minus one times the sample standard deviation of the explanatory variable squared. And so that is the somewhat complicated formula that allows us to say uh, what we believe will happen when x is zero. So it's a credible interval, but also we know that it's a confidence interval in that it will cover the true value in the certain proportion of repeated applications. So for instance, if you have a 95% interval, then 95% of the time it will include the true value. So it's appealing because we have both this credible and confidence interval interpretation about what happens when x is zero. If we look at this as a picture, we get something that looks like this. So this is our telomere data example. Again, we have the telomere length on the y-axis, that's our response. We have our years since diagnosis on the x-axis. And we have our uh, regression line, that is the fit line right there, the blue line going this direction. And then on that far left side, we have a line segment. And that line segment is that intercept with its uncertainty. So basically this says, when years since diagnosis is zero, then we expect the uh, telomere length to be, it's about 1.4, but there's some uncertainty there that's given by that line. This one happens to be the 95% interval. Um, and so that just tells you what you'd expect when x is zero. But now that x is zero is years since diagnosis is zero, and there's actually no observations there. And so for one thing, we might not be that interested in it. Number two, there's no real information that's there. We have data that's pretty close, but not exactly there. So the next step might be to say, well, what if we want to make a statement about some other value on the x-axis, some other explanatory variable value? In this example, some other years since diagnosis. Well, it turns out we can have a relatively easy equation to do that. The first step is just to say, well, what do we expect if instead of seeing x as zero, we see it as equal to little x. Well, that what we expect is fairly easy because we just plug in x into the expectation up there and we get this relationship, beta naught plus beta one x, right? But now we also have uncertainty about what that value is. The equation for the uncertainty is very similar to what we had before, but the modifications are upfront instead of just having beta naught, we have beta naught plus beta one x, where we have both the estimated values for beta naught, our intercept, and the estimated value for beta one, our slope. We have plus or minus a t critical value, that's the same. We have the estimated standard deviation, that's the same. We have the square root of one over n, that's the same. Plus, the numerator is the only thing that changes on this part of the equation. Instead of just having x bar squared, we have x bar squared minus x the actual value that we're interested in saying something about, divided by that same quantity in the denominator. And now if you go back and you plug in little x equals zero, you'll see that you recover exactly the equation that we had before. So this equation covers both that situation and all other situations for possible values for x. As a visualization of this, 
uh, I've now added that uncertainty bar um, on the previous picture that we had, right? So now that sort of grayish area, that provides that standard error for all values of x, and by default what the software does is it does all values for x within the range of values that we actually observed in our data set. And that's why you see it stopping on the right here and stopping on the left at the extent of our data. Now one thing to notice is that if you were to continue those bars out to the left, they would in fact, in fact actually match that blue bar. And the second thing is that the way that I interpret this uncertainty is to think about, all right, this is the line, and the line could be found anywhere within that gray region with probably 0.95. So if I'm thinking about a credible set of credible intervals, then I would say that my uncertainty about where that line is or my belief about where that line is, is 95% that it's within that gray area. If I'm thinking about, um, this is a confidence interval, what this says is that for any particular value for x, 95% of the time, that will include the true value for the line in that, for that value for x. All right, so that's fine, but you might be a little bit upset looking at this picture in that, look, there's a lot of observations that fall outside of that gray region. I mean, what's going on? Shouldn't that gray region cover all the data points? And the quick answer is no, it shouldn't. And the reason for that is because this is only the uncertainty in the line and not the uncertainty about where the data are going to appear. And so one way to think about it is to think about what if I had a lot of data? If I had a lot of data, then I would be very confident about where that line would be and those standard errors would in fact shrink. And you can see this in the previous equation. In the previous equation, Think about what happens when n gets really large. The first thing is that one over n becomes basically zero, but the second term within that square root also becomes zero, right? x squared, x bar squared minus x, that stays constant. But as you collect data, the denominator gets bigger and bigger and bigger, so that is also getting closer to zero, and therefore you get reduced uncertainty about this line. That is, the gray area shrinks and shrinks and shrinks and shrinks, okay? And so, if we want to say something about where the data are going to be, then we need something else. And typically this is called a prediction interval. So we're going to start with the same setup. And so we have our expected value when x is a particular value, little x, and that stays the same. It's still beta naught plus beta 1x. But you notice now that that's only the expected value. It doesn't talk about the variability that we see in the data around that value. That variability is given by sigma squared. Right, that's the variance or equivalently given by sigma, the standard deviation. And so there's only one thing that we have to change about the interval that we had previously to get a prediction interval. The only thing that we have to change is that we have to add within this square root sign a plus one. I put it at the front so it's a one plus, right? But we just have to add a one there and that's the only change that we have to make. But that change, right, the reason for that change is basically we need to account for an extra sigma squared. Sorry, an extra sigma. Let's go with sigma, right? And that extra sigma, that's what the one plus does. So go ahead and imagine the scenario again where you have lots of data. When you have lots of data, one over n is zero. That second uh, fraction in there the, that has denominator n minus one x s x squared, that also becomes large, so the, the fraction becomes zero. So those two fractions disappear. Right? And what you're left with there is a single sigma squared, which makes sense now because we have a variability up here, maybe it's over here somewhere along there. Uh, in that normal equation, right? we have a variability of sigma squared as a variance or sigma as that standard deviation. And so this prediction interval now accounts for the variability that we see in the data around that line. Now this prediction interval is both a credible interval and a confidence interval. That is, the credible interval interpretation is that is your belief about where a new observation will be when x is equal to little x. And it's a confidence interval in the sense that if you repeatedly use this with new data, right, you got new data, you did a prediction interval, you got new data, get a prediction interval, then it will cover the true value the right proportion of the time. All right, so I've got now the same picture we had before, but now I've added on those prediction interval bands for a particular value of x, right? So I just did this for all different values of x. And now we see those two red dashed lines. Those are the prediction intervals. So 
the idea here is if we had a new observation at some particular value on the x-axis, that would give us the uncertainty about where that new observation is going to be. And now you can see that that interval covers almost all the data, right? It's missing one of the data points down there on the low side, but right, these are, I should have said it, these are 95% intervals, right? And so we'd only expect it to cover about 95% of the observations. All right, so uh, that's the idea of both uncertainty and prediction intervals within the context of regression. Um, so those two intervals, right? The first one, the uncertainty interval, which is typically referred to a, as a confidence interval, but again, it's also a credible interval, but it's distinct from the prediction interval. And really what that says is, where is the line? Or it answers the question, where is the line? As a reminder, that's the equation. Then we have the second type of interval, which is asking about where will a new data point fall? And that new data point will fall, right, within this interval, the right proportion of the time, and we can make a statement about our belief in where that observation is going to lie. So that's that last comment that both of these intervals are actually confidence and credible intervals. All right, we're going to start moving forward and talking about uh, uses of logarithms within the context of regression, both for the explanatory variable, which we talked about a video ago, and with the response variable, which we'll mainly focus on in the next video. Hope to catch you there.